Good afternoon. It is 3.07 Wednesday, February 12th. This is the TDN Writer's Room. My name is Joe Bianca. I'm the associate editor of the Thoroughbred Daily News. I have the second best beard on the staff, <laughs> but the best hair. I'm Bill Finley, a correspondent for the Thoroughbred Daily News, and I couldn't grow a beard to save my life. Alan Carrasso, managing editor of the TDN, and my hair is slightly shorter than Joe's. Maybe I just have the most hair. I don't know if it's the best <laughs> hair. I'll, I'll go with the most hair. So big news this week, we now have a title sponsor at the TDN Writers Room. We're going to be the, become the TDN Writers Room presented by Keeneland, and we are super excited and thankful to have Keeneland aboard with us as this podcast continues to grow right, based off basically our sheer weight of personality in this room. I think that's <laughs> clearly what's happening here. Um, or in spite of it. <laughs> yeah. Um, but so we're really excited to have Keeneland aboard here and going forward. So this episode of the TDN Writers Room is sponsored by Keeneland, the home of world-class racing and industry-leading sales. Keeneland's next auction is the April two-year-olds in training and horses of racing age sale on Tuesday, April 7th. So it was a good weekend for Keeneland grads as the three major three-year-old races that everybody was looking at, basically the uh, Sam Davis, the San Vicente, and the Las Verjenas were all run, were all won by Keeneland grads. You had Sole Volante, Venetian Harbor, and... Uh, Nadal all went through the Keeneland sales ring. Interesting, Soli Volante was a $6,000 Keeneland September grad. And I think that's what's cool about having a big sale like that, um, that you can find these these diamonds in the rough later in the sale once the John Greens of the world have long <laughs> driven off in their Rolls Royces. You can stick around and find find some bargains at the sale. So that's that's pretty cool. And, and obviously... And pretty much any budget, maybe not mine, you can meet you can meet can meet your needs at Keeneland September. Al, I think you had a thought on Venetian Harbor. Yeah, just uh, just wanted to give her a shout out. Um, she was super impressive breaking her maiden on the dirt last time, first time out at the end of December there, um, having debuted on on the turf with a really good second place finish, and um, she was very eager on on the on the front end. You figured she'd be kicked away from there and ridden for speed and. Uh, but when Pratt asked her to go there in, in uh, turning for home, she really, really had a kick, and uh, that was that was very impressive. She's got a very, very quick female family underneath. It's the family of of safely kept, so um, you never know exactly how far they want to go, and and confirmation plays a role in the, in that as well. It's not just pedigree, obviously, but um, listen, based on what she did uh, last time and. And going forward into the race like the San Diego Oaks, she's a very exciting prospect. Cost 110000 at the September sale in 2018. The Green Group Guest of the Week is sponsored by The Green Group, a tax consulting and advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. With more than 500 clients in the horse business, they were bred to save you money. For more information on how they can help you, visit www.greenco.com. So for this week's Green Group Guest of the Week, we welcome the one, the only, the legend, Jim Rome. Thanks so much for joining us, Jim. My man, what's going on? That, that's a bit much, but <laughs> hey, good man. to be here. <laughs> no, we are so happy to have you on. Um, so I, I guess we'll start from the top. I remember back in the day watching your show and listening to you, and you used to poke fun at, at racing a little bit um, about how it wasn't really a real sport. And now look at you. Now you're owning and breeding. you got a bunch of nice horses. You've had horses win grade ones. I want to know what from the beginning got you into racing? What got that tide to turn for you and how you looked at racing? All right. So I, I want to say this back, back in the day, I said what I meant and I always mean what I say, but what I said about the sport was it's a bet and not a sport. And those inside the sport were not real happy about that. Never let me forget it. Yeah. It was never my intention to get into the game. The, the quick version of how I got into the game is we, I used to work in San Diego and I met my wife in San Diego. So we would go to Del Mar and I moved back to LA and we would go to Del Mar. The one guy that I kept running into wherever I turned in Del Mar was Billy Koch from Little Red Feather Racing. And he would say to me, Jim, I'm telling you, you should be in the game. You should be in the game. And I would say, Billy, I've got no interest in being in the game. I want to come to Del Mar, have a cocktail, watch the races, and I'm fine. And then, But he, he would not let it go. One night, my wife, Janet, says to me, you know, we should do this. I said, do what? She said, we should get a, a peaceful racehorse. I said, why would I do that? I have no interest. And she said, I've been on you to get a hobby. Let's do it. It'll be fun. So we buy a piece of a horse, and this horse is named Wing Forward, and he's Argentinian bred. He comes to, I can't remember if it was Hollywood Park or Santa Anita, but I go to the race. And you guys, you have to understand, I'm really naive to the whole process. Like, I think I know sports, but I don't know horse racing. This horse 
to quote Trevor Dan Main, came from out of the clouds, from worst to first. Now, I'm not kidding you. It's like somebody rolled up on me and shot me with equine crack. <laughs> I, turned to, I, I turned to Koch, and I'm like, dude, what else do you have to sell me? What else can I buy? Like, it all changed in a second. My whole life changed in a second. It was the most amazing thing. I could not wait to get on the radio a couple days later and share the experience. And everybody's like, dude, you hate horse racing. I'm like, not anymore, I don't. <laughs> so that, that literally was it. I bought a piece of this horse. He, like, if that horse runs middle of the pack. I don't know if you and I are having this conversation, but he didn't. He won and it was euphoric. Wow. Jim, Bill Finley, thanks again for joining us. And uh, what an interesting career you've had in racing as well as, of course, outside of racing. And reading up on you, you could have stopped at that point or just invested in a horse here or there, but you really went all in. And you gave a quote to somebody that said that what really appeals to you most more than anything else in racing is the animal, the horse. So why don't you take us through your feelings about the animal and how that has uh, made you more of an owner or more involved in ownership than you might have been otherwise? I mean, guys, like I'm editing myself. Like, how much time do you have? I, I can't. <laughs> all day. All I mean, day. Like, somebody, somebody said to me early on, you know, here's your problem. And I, I really have had trouble even after all this time separating the business from the animal because it is a business. And as we know, it's a really difficult business. Somebody said to me early on, here's your problem, Jim. And this is what you're going to run into. You fall in love with every single one of the horses. That's going to be your problem. I said, my problem, I go, this is why I'm in the business because I fall in love with every one of the horses. And it didn't matter to me. We were having, you have to understand this. We were hemorrhaging money. We were having no success. Never mind winning a stake race. I couldn't get into a stake race, but I was having the time of my life because I loved every one of the animals. They were so different, so unique. And I could recognize the athletic qualities in the horses. And I can tell you literally the most surreal times of my entire life, some of the best moments of my entire life and some of the most devastating moments of my entire life have been at the racetrack. And it's not because of the bad beats or the wins. Those were amazing. It's because of the animals. The best things that have ever happened have been because of those animals. And the saddest, most depressing things in my life have also been because of the animals. So, yes, first and foremost, I love the animal more than anything else, more than the business, more than the wins. Hey, uh, Jim, it's Alan Carrasso. It's great to have you on. I really appreciate Alan, it. Alan, how are you? I'm well, thanks. Um, I want your voice, by the way. If you could sell me a piece of your voice, I've, I'm, I'm No, buying. you don't. <laughs> um, as you might remember, uh, Shared Belief was one of my favorites. I know that uh, he helped to put you on the map, so to speak, with uh, uh, Misdirection, two-time Breeders' Cup winner. But take us back through the journey of, of Shared Belief. You just referenced the, the heartbreak uh, aspect of, of this game and um, he, the shared belief sh surely took you through some of the highs and, and then uh, some of the lows of, of the game. Just take us through that, that journey. Just, I, I gotta be honest. Like I, I I'm still not right. I'm, I'm, I will never be right. Like I'm better, obviously, you know, but he, when he got colic and he passed away, I've told the story, but I'll never forget. I was on the air and, and Alex called me Alex Solis. And that, that was not a normal time to get a telephone call from Alex Solis and he said to me, I was like, literally in the middle of my radio program, I'm, I'm almost choking up even sharing this. He says to me, Jim, the big horse has colic. And I said, oh, my God. I said, how, how bad is that? He says, Jim, it's not good. It's not good at all. They're rushing him to UC Davis right now. I don't know. I don't know. I said, all right, I, I'm in the middle of the show. You, you need to keep me posted. And then just like that, share belief was gone. And he had taken us on the most amazing ride. This horse, my God, this horse was so amazing to be around. Like the story about Share Belief is this. We knew that we were going to auction with Ms. Direction. And Alex had known about this gelding that had run up at Golden Gate up north. And they were bringing him down to run down south for Jerry Hollendorfer. But apparently the horse was for sale. And he showed me the, the videotape of the win, the replay. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, do, can we buy that horse? It was just unbelievable. He ran right off the track. And Alex said, I think we can. I think we can. And the thinking was he was pretty pricey for a gelding. But we thought to ourselves, we're selling misdirection. This will be a fun play. If we get our money back, that'd be even better. But it would just be some action. And they run the horse back in 21 days in a grade three. And he's just as impressive. And then the race ends. And Alex says, you know, you're going to be the favorite in a grade one next. And I'm like, this thing is spinning so fast. I can't even process it. How did we find this horse? How did this happen? And then he runs in the cash call futility futur or futurity at Hollywood Park, the last grade one there. And the next thing you know, I'm on a plane 
to the Eclipse Awards to accept the award for the best two-year-old male. And I, I can't even figure out how this happened, but it was such an amazing ride. And then we all know the story about Cher Belief. He was on the Derby Trail, and then he had an abscess, and he had quarter cracks, and it just was so amazing. And then he got sick, and then he passed away. And I don't know, you know, like some of the group, we talk about it still, and some of the group will say, be grateful for what you had, and it was an amazing experience. That's true. I get all that. But man, I what I would give to spend one more hour with that horse just right now and just hang out, you know? I just, I, I still really miss the horse terribly, terribly. Not to bring, not to bring you all down, but like <laughs> he, he was, it was magical. Like you, you can't even believe you guys are horse people. So you understand this. I try and explain this to non-horse people and it's impossible. This horse was so electric and so amazing to be around. Like I remember they'd walk him through the paddock before a race and like everybody would say, like, well, you ain't much to look at. I used to take offense to that. Right. Cause I mean, he was not a big horse. He was just a little gelding, but man, he, he didn't know. He thought he was 18 hands, and the way this horse would puff up before races like a gladiator, like it was the most amazing thing to see. Yeah. Amazing. He was incredible. Uh, Jim, this is Joe again. I'm going to put you on the spot here. I'm going to ask you a broader question about racing because in addition to being a successful broadcaster, I think you've been a successful marketer too. You have to be to amass the kind of following that you have. So are there are there lessons that you've learned in your career in media that you think could be applied to the way racing presents itself and the way racing markets itself? And kind of related to that, have you have you converted people into racing fans and is there something that can be applied to what you've done to the greater scheme of racing? I, I just, I, I know this is a big issue for the sport without question, you know, in terms of trying to convert new fans or bring new fans or get younger fans, it is hard. I don't have that magic answer. I, I think that some of my, my listeners, I think, have kind of gravitated to it a little bit. And, and by the way, that they're a stick and ball crowd. They're not just because I like it doesn't mean they will. But I think that some of them sense the ones that had an open mind that I had this great passion for it, and this great excitement for it. And they're like, well, damn, if he likes it that much, maybe I will too. And then they started to follow it. And once you get them in the door, you have an opportunity. I think part of the challenge is it's not the easiest thing to learn, right? It's not yeah. easy. It's not it's not the easiest thing to learn. The other problem is, as we know, the business, a lot of the business of the business is back at the breeding shed. So it's not like we have these athletes that have super long careers. We're so quick to get the horses off the track to get them to the breeding shed that it's kind of hard to identify with the horses if you don't know because they don't have these long careers. I'll never forget, like when we retired in this direction it seemed to me to be like a no brainer. Like she's five, she's a back-to-back -back breeders cup champion. She had some physical issues. I wanted her to walk off as a champion and to end her career that way. And it seemed to me to be a no brainer, but I had people like, like fans of the sport saying, man, you are so selfish. You are so selfish. Run that mare, run that mare. And I didn't understand it. Like I thought I was doing right by the horse mm. to get her off the track and let her begin her, her post racing career. But, but I understand that like, People love the horse. They identified with the horse. They wanted to run the horse. So I think part of the problem is that they don't have super long careers. In terms of what would benefit the industry, I can only go by what I've always preached on the air and what's worked for me. You got to be accountable, right? You got to be transparent. You have to be accountable. You have to be responsible. And if things don't go well, I think you need to own them and be accountable and be responsible. And if I'm being really honest with you, I think one of the issues with the industry, when things don't go well, man, you cannot put your head in the sand and say this too shall pass. They'll move on to something else because they haven't moved on to something else. There are some real issues affecting the sport, and I think you need to confront them and own them and be accountable to them. Totally. Jim, you just used the term non-horse people, and that's a good term to use because really you can put everybody in racing into one or two categories, the very insular world of people who are involved in the game, and then the non-people. You circulate among non-racing people as well. In light of all that has happened in Santa Anita with the breakdowns and the negative publicity the sport has gotten, what do you hear from people, be it uh, the man on the street, be it famous athletes? What seems to be their opinion of horse racing in 2020? Yeah, I get the same thing all the time. What the hell is going on? What the hell is going on there? What do you, what, what's going on at that track? What's going on in that sport? Like they, they, they don't understand. And I, and, and I look on some level, I don't understand some of what goes on either. I understand their concerns and it's, it's hard to explain or justify some of what goes on. You know, you're right. It's very insular. And either you're in it and you understand it or you don't and it's hard to explain or you don't or aren't and don't want to hear any explanation. Right. I think that people have this sense that 
it, uh, how about this? They find it very hard to believe that we quote love the animal. Mm. Like if you love the animal, why do you race the animal? Or if you love the animal, why are you doing this? Like they, they don't get it. There's a disconnect. Like you, they're like they're calling me a liar. N- no, you don't. You obviously don't love the animal if you're in horse racing. Mm. I'm like, yeah, but I'm in horse racing because I love the animal. And then the thing just veers off the track altogether. It's a really difficult thing to explain to people that are not in it. And by the way, if we're going to be really honest, not everybody in it loves the animal, right? Mm-hmm. So it's it's there's so many challenging things about it. There really are. But on the outside looking in, these are hard conversations that I have, and not everybody's open to hearing what we have to say about it. I wanted to ask you about a horse you got running right now. It was actually a homebred, um, Gadgetta, who is by Fast Anna, first crop sire over at Three Chimneys, out of Gidget Girl. Um, she had a good third on her debut and then ran down a really heavily bet Bob Baffert first or second time out, looked good. What have you seen from her so far, and what are the, what's the plan for her going forward? Uh, I can't even tell you how much this horse means to me. Like, like we won a couple of Breeders' Cup races. We had shared belief. That – her breaking that maiden recently was one of the highlights of my equine life. I, I don't even know where to start. Like this is a, a more than a 10 year odyssey mm. to get this horse to the track. You guys know how hard it is just to get horses to the track, right? This is the first homebred that we've ever raced even not wow. that we have this big plan for developing or breeding horses, but we've tried. Like I had this, this, the, the first love of my equine life was a horse named surfer girl that Billy Koch had bought for me that was a three-year-old mare, Brazilian mare. And we brought her in and she was a hard luck filly. Like nothing went right for her. And she got really sick and actually almost died. And it was really a, a just terrifying thing. I get her off the track and I breed her. And just really quick sidebar, like my first experience with breeding was, it was so humbling. And so it was, it was, it was hilarious, really. Like I go back to Kentucky for the first time and we see this mare who I, by the way, I've never seen a horse away from the track at this point. So when I see, I go back to not to three chimneys case, case clay had a leasing agreement with a farm called Sheltowee. And we sent her there and I'm seeing this horse in captivity. Like I'm seeing her run around in pastures and roll over. I was awed by the whole thing. In fact, the first thing I saw was I got, you know, Jen Royce. Jen Royce sends me a videotape of her getting off the van. And I know I'm digressing here, but it, it, the whole experience was amazing. So I go back there and we're looking for sires and I'm falling in love again with everything I see. And Alex Elise is like, dude, you know, the, with your Philly, because she's not much they're going to pick you. You're not going to pick them. I'm like, yeah, but I will write the check right now. Like, like tap it. They're like, <laughs> he's laughing at me. He's like, you're, ta- you're not breeding to tap it. Right. <laughs> for, for more reasons, I can explain to you, Jim, you're not spending that money. You're not going to overbreed your Philly. And I, and I just don't get it. Like I see Malibu moon. I'm like, Oh my God, look at that horse. So I'm going through this whole thing and we, we have nothing but bad luck. Like we breed her to pulpit and the baby just wasn't much. Didn't work out. Wasn't, didn't make it to the track found a home for her. And then I made some choices about Alex that bit me in the bud and blah, 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 blah. And then finally, like we've never had a baby make it to the track until Gidgetta. And Gidgetta is the daughter of Gidget Girl, who's the daughter of Surfer Girl. And even she was nothing, like all the way through the process, Alex is saying to me, Jim, she's not much. She's not much. Eddie Woods had her. Eddie's like, she's okay. She's okay. And then right before I'm trying to find a home for this horse, Eddie goes, you know, she might be pretty useful. I'm like, really? Really? This is amazing. We like I can get her to a trainer. We can put her in training. She comes out here. She goes to Richie Baltus. She runs at Del Mar. And like you said, a pretty good third. And that's already one of the highlights of my equine life. Like we got her in the gate mm. and she ran a good third. And then really quickly to that race, you're talking about a, a maiden special weight. A buddy of mine goes, dude, like you're running her against those two Baffert horses. Like, what are you doing? Like you have a nice little homebred, but I'm like, what am I doing? I'm letting the horse people make horse decisions. What, do you mean, <laughs> what am I doing? So we, she goes in the gate and she's nine to two against a one to nine, goes off one to five. And she's she's running between the two Baffert horses that are worth a million dollars. And we bred her to Fast Anna for whatever that was. And this this thing gets up. She gets up and she wins that race. And Alex thumbs me out of text and says, congratulations. That was unbelievable. I said, Alex, why am I shaking? We've won <laughs> Breeders' Cup races. We've won. We had shared belief. Why am I shaking? It was one of the most amazing things ever. So no matter what happens going forward, the fact that we bred a horse that won a race, that beat a, a high-priced Bob Baffert horse, which doesn't happen very often, was amazing. Like, what does she do next? You know, I think we'll try and find her another allowance race, but if that's not there, I'll see what Richie and Alex say. But man, it, 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 it's fa- she's family. She's family. I cannot tell you how much I love that horse and how much it means to us. That's great, man. And has that inspired you to try to do the breeding side a little bit more, or are you just going to keep it small for now? You know, it's it's funny. I, I I don't need more than what I have, but like Richie, Richie said to me, 
keep that mare, man. Keep that mare. That's a nice horse. And the funny thing about the mare was, like, that Gidget girl, it, here's the heartbreak of the, the sport to me. Like, you know the good stories, but some of the heartbreak is that Gidget girl, the mare, got all the way up until the week of her first race. Mike Pipey had her, and she got hurt in training and was going to miss a whole year. And I'm like, I can't do this anymore. I, I really can't. It's just too hard. It's too frustrating. And Alex said, I can find her a home, but before we do that, do you want us to – kind of look her over and see if she might be a breeding prospect i'm like do that and the amazing thing was alex said to me jim you know i i i'm a little surprised but if you look at the analytics and the metrics and the work we do she measures up with some of the mares that we buy for jamie roth i'm like wow really our, our homebred he said yeah if you want to take a shot with breeding or go ahead so like we have her still we we sold a yearling Last year from her, they did pretty well, which which was nice to, to take some money off the table. We have this one. We currently have last year's crop, which is a straight fire colt. And now we have to decide who to breed back to. And, and obviously, Fast Anna is a possibility. So to answer the question, I'm not going to have this gigantic breeding operation. But all of a sudden, people are saying good things about this family. So we're having fun with it. That's awesome. She's only seven years old, too, right? So Right. She's got right. a lot of time. So there's... Yeah, I think. Hopefully. Knock on wood. Yeah. She's young. Cool. Hey, Jim, give me an over-under on the Chicago Cubs this year. You know, I, <laughs> I'm going to see. I mean, win, win total? Yes. I'll say 89 over-under. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm because, ask, I'm, because, because I'm a magnanimous guy and a great guy. <laughs> Can I ask about my Jets, too, that we're doing loser franchise win over-unders? <laughs> yeah, let's, let's go with two. Oh, wow. Ouch. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just messing with you. Oh, four. Be nice to my, my boy, Sam. Be nice to him. Four, I love Sam. Hey, look, Sam, I'm, an orange, I'm a Orange County, Southern California guy. You know I love Sam. All right. I love Sam. I can't <laughs> do it all it. by himself, now, but I'm a big Sam now guy. Now they love. got Mookie Betts in California for the Dodgers, so I don't want to hear you complain, Jim. You just took – they fleeced the Red Sox. They destroyed my love affair with that team, and uh, I'd be pulling for Mookie this year. Wait, wait, is it my fault that your team cheats? <laughs> yeah. Is it, is it my fault that you just gave up a Hall of Famer? Yeah. I, I didn't say trade a Hall of Famer <laughs> okay. entering his prime. All right. Please tell I didn't that, say cheat. Please tell that to John Henry. Not the horse, by the way. <laughs> no. No. I, I, I probably would have a better chance of making sense to the horse than the owner. Right. Like, okay. who, who trades a 27-year-old yeah. Mookie Betts? That's a great idea. R- ridiculous. Bill Absolutely tries to ridiculous. make every week a uh, Red Sox podcast episode, so we appreciate <laughs> you indulging him a little bit. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I got to be real. Like, I got family in Boston, but let's be real about that. You don't trade Hall of Famers entering their prime. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. All right. On that note, Jim, thank you so much for the time. Great stuff, man. And good luck with Good Jetta, man. She's really exciting. I really appreciate you guys saying that. So uh, fingers crossed, knock on wood, all that horse stuff that we say for uh, the mayor. Like, couldn't be having more fun with her. For sure. Thanks, you guys. For sure, man. Thanks Go so get much. him. Thanks. Thanks, Jim. Okay, see you guys. The Green Group Guest of the Week is sponsored by The Green Group, an accounting, tax, consulting, and advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. As the Green Group Guest of the Week, Jim Rome will receive a free one-hour tax consultation. The Green Group, bred to save you money. For more information on how they can help you, visit www.greenco.com. So we'll start off this week with a little recap of the three-year-old preps from last weekend. A um, couple of pretty good performances. I was, as someone who was against Independence Hall, I thought he had a lot of knocks on him going into that race. First time two turns, he had his immaturity antics, uh, new new racetrack, new surface. I thought he ran an incredible race, and I got a little bit lucky that Soleil Volante was able to run him down from the parking lot. And it you could just see as that race was was the pace was percolating you could see the independence hall was a little bit too close to it and i honestly am surprised at how close he got to that horse from way back uh i thought he ran he ran really well and i think proved more in defeat than he had in any of his previous wins Soli volante is really exciting too such an interesting thing to have patrick bianco now with these two horses that started out as turf horses and really are bred to be turf horses by caraconti and summer front in Soli volante and ette indian who now maybe both could end up in the derby so that's a really interesting part of it but i just wanted to mention how great i thought independence hall ran and then nadal in the san vicente uh, one of those races where he was, I thought he was way, way over bet and I think made a lot of people nervous, but, uh, you know, 21 and four, 44 flat to keep digging like that. Pretty confident ride from Joel Rosario. I think he's got better things going forward too, for him as well. My take on Independence Hall is that he lost 
And Joe, it's not the first time I've heard someone say that. He's been getting a lot of positive feedback or a lot of positive press, uh, et cetera, from that race. But, you know, this wasn't exactly the Kentucky Derby. It was the bleeping Sam F. Davis. And, you know, I don't remember the odds, but I'm sure he's, what, one to five? He's like to three five. to five, I yeah, think. Yeah, something like that. I just don't think he's supposed to lose that race, no matter how the trip went, uh, no matter what you might think of Sol Volante. Um, I think he took a step backwards. And, uh, you know, I know he's, he's quirky. He's got a lot of, uh, you know, antics that he, he throws away in the paddock and, and stuff like that. But I think it's a case of, you know, missing the trees for the forest that, you know, everybody's looking sort of at the, you know, bigger picture when you need to zero in on the fact that the horse got beat. So that's my take on that one. I just go through the others. Um, I thought Nadal was good. Um, he didn't blow me away. I thought at one point he's going to get beat. Yeah. Um, and so he did show a lot of gameness. I don't know how much you can judge off a seven furlong race where he won by three quarters of a length. Storm the court was okay, probably just okay in there. And then my uh, favorite horse is Louisiana Lightning. No parole at Delta Downs, who wins by like 100 lengths against Louisiana Mystery Brad. Horse. Mystery. And, yeah, and you know what is he going to do when he runs against real horses? I, I think the horses like that are a lot of fun, um, you know, because – you know, you just you can't go by the speed figures. They don't mean anything. He only got a 79 buyer. If you watch that race, I mean, you know, he's basically like, you know, galloping around the racetrack in a paid public workout. So I'm, I'm really interested to see what he does down the road for Tom Amos and Maggie Moss. Yeah, I agree on in, Independence Hall. Uh, I mean, he did sit a good trip, but that pace certainly was fast. And that strip at, at Tampa is notoriously quirky. Not every horse gets over it. Um, so I, I, I thought on balance... Uh, I thought it was a positive. I thought he actually stepped forward from from the Jerome. And I think he can improve. He definitely needs to work out his behavioral quirks. Um, If he's going to stay 10 for a long time, I pulled this pedigree looking deeper in his family. It's family of Desert Stormer. He's a Breeders' Cup sprint winner. And I guess I have the smallest um, shred of doubt that he might not want a derby distance, but I guess we'll find that out as as we go forward. I, I'm with you on uh, on Nadal. We should have asked Jim about N- Nadal versus Ginobili. I mean, he might, <laughs> yeah. might have something to say about that. Yeah, I, I thought he was okay. I mean, the, the pace was obviously fast. He he managed to to grind that out. Uh, Ginobili had done good things when he won his maiden, but a whole, not a whole lot since. I'm curious to see how he stretches out. Um, I I wasn't blown away by him either. And you know, no parole. Let's see what happens when you know when he sends him to Oaklawn for a race like the Rebel or something like that. Just to touch on Independence Hall and what I was saying. So he was. I'm looking at the running lines now. He was third, two and a half lengths back at the at the after the quarter um, call. Then was two lengths back, third at the half mile pole, took or the half call, and then took the lead at the three quarter pole. Here's where the two horses in front of him finished. Premier Star, who was dueling with Chapaloo was six beaten 29 lengths and just edged out Chapaloo who was beaten 29 and a half lengths at the back of the pack. And Soli Volante was 12 and a half lengths back after the first call, 15 and a half lengths back after the second call. So I, I agree that it would have been great to see him, you know, go on a little bit more and win the race, but you got to, you have to look at the context. And when you're tracking two horses who have been beaten now 30 lengths at the back of the pack, I don't know if Chapaloo is that great, but I think Premier Star has got a lot of talent. He's a TDN rising star. He was stretching out to two turns for the first time. I think when a horse is that far clear of the rest of the field, you got to look at where the other horses that were in his zip code early finished, and they couldn't have really been beaten any more badly. And he was still 11 and a half lengths clear of Ajaweed for third, who I, th- I thought got a perfect trip and really had kind of no excuse not to do better than that, at least make more of a dent. So I think you got to look at the context of – who he was running with early, and whether or not those horses stuck around late, and they sure didn't. Do you realize we've gone through the whole round table here, and I was the only one to even mention Storm, Storm the Court? court. Uh, now, you know, this this is probably the, as least exciting a two-year-old champion, whether that's fair or not, it is true. I mean, nobody is really that high on this horse. You know, a lot of people thought that he won a fluky Breeders' Cup. So he comes back. I'll throw the question to you guys. Do you think any less or more of him now than you did prior to the San Vicente? I, I don't think my opinion has changed in a material sort of way. Um, I don't. I, guess, I don't detect much optimism in your voice. Well, I, I, generally speaking, I like to see horses coming back from that sort of layoff at that trip. I just want to see them finish and run through the line. And I thought he was just sort of one pace. Um, my, my hunch is that he's going to find a dozen or so 
three year olds this year that have kind of gone on quicker than than he has. I think it's interesting the contrast and the way those those two races were run because you really did did have like kind of a turned upside down uh, scenario in the Sam Davis where the horses that were up front early ended up at the back of the pack. The horse comes from way back to win, whereas the San Vicente. It was also a fast pace, but everybody was pretty close to it. I think the entire field was within a couple lengths of each other through the first half mile. And I feel like they kind of all just ran around the track except for the top two. So I I agree with Al that it was an even effort from Storm the Court. And I I understand why people aren't too high on him. Um, But I just I don't think there's a ton to take out of that race. I thought one of the interesting things about that was the betting, too. I mean, I, I figured that Nadal would be the favorite, but look at the two horses on paper. You have a horse that's broken its maiden versus a horse that's the two-year-old champion and the Breeders' Cup Juvenile winner. Who's supposed to be two to five and, mm. and who's supposed to be five to two there? Um, the betters really got it right. And, and, you know, I think part of that is the Bob Baffert hype machine, you know, Baffert with a exciting three-year-old, et cetera. But uh, my goodness, talk about, you know, the betting from normal circumstances being turned upside down. I think that's also a reflection that the Betters didn't think that much of Storm the Court, and you know, pretty much they were right. Yeah, I guess a 98 buyer speed figure first time out jumps off, off the page, yeah. and everybody will, will kind of clamor for that. I want to go back to Soleil Volante for one just one second. Um, it, it's really interesting that you brought up Ete and Deanne as well. By uh, two horses by Sires who did their best work on the grass, Caraconte, Breeders' Cup mile winner, uh, summer front, a, a good um, grade one quality miler. Um, interesting that they're getting dirt runners. Yeah. And particularly Soli Volante, um, his family is all the Flaxman, the Arcos Holdings. Um, under his second dam is Ulysses, who uh, was very good up to 10 furlongs on the grass and was third in the arc, I believe, at, at 12 furlongs. So he, uh, if I don't think Independence Hall is going to get the trip, I'm very confident Soli Volante will. It's just, I, I think it's so interesting with Patrick Bian Cohen, who was completely off the map for a long time maybe deservedly so, depending on what you believe about him. And then to come back with potentially two horses on the Triple Crown Trail that are very, I think, unorthodox horses in terms of their path to the Derby. I think that's one of the interesting subplots going forward as, as we go down the Derby Trail. I also wanted to mention real quick, we're not going to do a whole preview of this, but in terms of what's coming up this weekend, you got the Risen Star at Fairgrounds, which was a big enough field that they had to split it into two divisions. And then a, an optional claimer Friday at Tampa Bay Downs might have a lot of derby implications as well, because Governor Morris, who was a TDN Rising Star, first out debut winner at Saratoga, was second to Max Field as the favorite in the Breeders' Futurity. He's going to make his three-year-old debut Friday, and he's not the only big horse in that race, Untitled, who had that huge debut win and then was privately purchased or bought into by Gary Barber and transferred to Mark Cassie. Didn't run that well in the swale with a little bit of a tough trip. He's back on uh, in short on short rest to take on Governor Morris. A couple other interesting horses in there. Friday, the sixth race at Tampa Bay Downs, could have even more derby, impl- derby implications than the Risen Star. So that's what's coming up this weekend the tdn writers room is sponsored by west point thoroughbreds owning a racehorse with west point thoroughbreds can be one of the most exciting experiences of your life partnerships offer the thrills and gratification of the sport of kings at a fraction of the investment required to purchase and maintain an entire horse on your own experience for yourself why west point thoroughbreds is the gold standard in racing partnerships visit our website westpointtb.com Joe, uh, I'm not a big XFL fan. Um, I don't know how anyone could be, but after the fact, when they were giving all the Monday morning quarterback reviews of the XFL, this is a league that completely f- was fell flat on its face when they tried it the first time. They brought it back after, I believe, 19 years and of the first incarnation of the XFL, which really fell flat on his face. And everybody was saying really good things about it. And the thing that they were talking about was all these new innovations they had, uh, different uh, kickoff things, different extra point things. So what the heck does the XFL have to do with horse racing? I noticed, and a lot of people wrote about this, that when there was a disputed play, they took you into the replay room. The camera was right there. And I saw this. I didn't watch the XFL, but I saw it later on, you know, social media and YouTube and that sort of thing. And they had the guy discussing the play, you know, pointing to this. It was his foot in bounds. Was it not in bounds? You know, another guy giving his opinion. Wouldn't that be fantastic for horse racing? Take that concept and just put it in the stewards booth and look at the XFL. They get it versus horse racing when 
there was so much egg on everybody's face after the Kentucky Derby. I thought that was handled. I think everybody here is in agreement with that. That was handled miserably. That they did have the camera in the booth, but we didn't have any audio. And we just saw these guys. We didn't have any idea what they were doing for 20 minutes. And then the worst part was when the stewards came out and they read a brief statement and then they wouldn't take any questions from the press. You know, we're talking all, every week about little things that horse racing can do to be better and be a better sport. You know, do the right thing. This isn't going to change horse racing as we know it. It's not going to mean that, you know, tomorrow they're going to handle an extra million dollars at Laurel or something like that. But isn't the right way to do things? Everything should be transparent as possible. Everybody in horse racing should look at what the XFL did, learn by example, and I think it would be really cool to hear the stewards deliberate while they're doing it live. And then after they make the decision, they should come on closed circuit TV and have to explain themselves. How can they not? I think it's, inter- it's an interesting corollary, too, with a, a, a new league. And racing isn't new, but it is in a similar predicament where it has to grow its customer base. And the XFL won't survive past a year or two unless it grows its customer base. So they have to throw in these extra little wrinkles to differentiate themselves from the behemoth in the arena, which is the NFL. I think racing is in a similar spot. And I, and we talked to Jim Rome mentioned this. He was talking about the, the accountability aspect of racing. And I, I got to think that if we had a, if we had a mic in the stewards room when they're going over an inquiry or something, a lot of us would be shocked at how little some of them know about what they're doing. Honestly, that's that's just my opinion. Like, obviously, I have no proof of this because they don't they're not not transparent about what they're talking about. But I think there would be a lot of conversations that a lot of regular racing fans would be like, "What? Like, that's what you're looking at? Like, that's that's what you're deciding this based on?" And I think that worries some people in racing who have kind of elevated to that position. I'm going to get a lot of hate mail from stewards now, <laughs> but no, I just I I think it's 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 a, a potential for embarrassment for these racing stewards and, and that's why they don't want it. But I agree. I mean, I don't understand why the NFL doesn't do that to, to give some kind of insight into the process that especially in racing is, you know, affecting millions and millions and millions of dollars. It's just, it's, it's, it shouldn't be a black box. Um, I want to take it one step further. And we talked a lot about this with Pat Cummings, who I thought was a really good interview. And he was on the same wavelength. He was, this sport has to try new things. And maybe 90% of them will fail. We don't know. But look at the XFL. And it wasn't just the stewards thing. It was, again, all these different uh, nuances they had. And, you know, with the kickoffs, with the replay booths, et cetera, um, you know, the first time out they tried to like have, you know, like scantily clad cheerleaders and you get a peek of them in the locker room. Oh, boy. Um, and that didn't work. So here's a new startup that's trying to attract fans. And again, the extra point thing. What if you could get a three point extra point on one of the no, players? You're the XFL yeah. expert. Yeah. I, oh, I just that. live and breathe the XFL. <laughs> but could you believe there was betting on that? So how the heck did people know that the uh, you know the San Jose whatevers were seven and a half point favorites? There's betting that? on the puppy bowl. Yeah, Bill, exactly. So okay, it's, it's but anyways, so it goes to the same thing. Try new things. See what works. There's no innovation in this sport. You know, the one thing that comes to mind right away is the fixed odds betting. Uh, there's a new innovation being tried at Monmouth Park. Will it work? Maybe not. But Isn't it worth trying these things? So, uh, you know, I never thought the horse racing should be taking lessons from Vince McMahon. (laughs) But you know what? Uh, Vince got this one right, it looks like. And uh, look, you know, maybe the XFL will flame out and it'll be gone, at you know, six games into the season. But people really gave that just rave reviews after the first week. And I think a lot of people will be watching the XFL this week uh, because they heard so many good things about it. And I think it's interesting because that they, they had another league that tried to get off the ground last year in the AAF and I think that what the mistake that they made is they basically just tried to be like a baby version of the NFL and no one's interested in that they can go to the actual thing we'll watch the actual NFL college football is going to be better than that so I think the way you do differentiate yourself if you're the XFL is to have these little changes and wrinkles and stuff that makes you stand out and transparency is a good road to go down for that as well and I think you're right. Racing has has tried very little. It's, it's it's like a great Simpsons thing where Ned Flanders is a kid and he's su- he's such a pr- troublemaker and his parents are hippies and they're like we tried nothing and we're all out of ideas. It's like that's how I feel about racing sometimes. Do you realize we just went from the XFL only you, to horse racing to the, the Simpsons. Simpsons? I mean, only then, you, Joe. Yeah, okay. That's why Keelan's paying the big bucks. That's, that's, okay. that's why the Simpsons yes. and XFL discussion. That's yes. why the TDN writers' room is a must listen. That's for sure. Sure. Where else <laughs> can you get XFL and the Simpsons right. in a discussion of horse racing? Right. Yep. And, and over yeah. under on, on baseball. We so, a race, by the yeah. way. Yeah. 
Uh, hey, I don't have much to add to, to the discussion. I had a, uh, a conversation uh, probably a year and a half ago with Kim Kelly, who's the chief stipe in Hong Kong. And I, it, it, we're never going to get to that level of detail. I mean, for, for every day of racing in Hong Kong, which obviously they race two days a week, so that by definition makes it easier. But there is a detailed report, uh, comments in running, analysis of jockeys' rides, explanations of fines handed out and disciplinary action this and recommendations in terms of what to do next time like we're never going to get there but but yeah don't we have to do i mean something is better than nothing like we're doing nothing right now yeah and what kim said it when i spoke, spoke with him is that there's I, I mean obviously it's a transparency issue but in order to foster the trust among your customers like you have to I, 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 he it gave an analogy of, like if you don't like a restaurant, you're not going to go there anymore, right. and people are going to go away from horse racing because it just it's unreliable. Well, transparency is never a bad thing. Yeah, I, I, it's just never a bad thing. And you know, we have this example of the Kentucky Derby. That was a you know, forget about the the disqualification and Gary West's lawsuit and everything. Uh, probably the worst aspect of that whole day to me was how the stewards handled that. It was a real black eye for this sport. And and you know what? I'm sure the lawyers told them. Don't say anything because we're in fear of getting sued. And then they got sued anyways. Yeah. So, you know, that, that learn from your mistakes. And look, maybe you don't need to do this on the third race at Finger Lakes uh, uh, on a Tuesday afternoon or something. But my goodness, you know, to, for the stewards to duck all questions after the Kentucky Derby. I'll remember that aspect of the Derby maybe many years after I'll remember that Luis Saez took a, you know, right turn and wiped out a couple horse long range toddy at the top of the stretch and stuff. I just, that was one of the really you know, bad moment where the sport just looked like it was run by a bunch of huckleberries. Well, and the thing is that kind of, that kind of stuff happens er, pretty much every single day. Stewards rulings that seem capricious and nobody really knows what the, what their justification was, you know, takeout rates are high. So I think we're at the point in racing where I think we've spent a lot of time and a lot of years trying to attract new customers to racing. I think what needs to happen more so now is trying to keep the customers you do have happy because there's a lot of garbage that you got to put up with in racing as a horse player. And I, I, I've seen people walk away from the sport, from betting the sport. And it's because the, the powers that be are so not so unreceptive to any kind of criticism whatsoever, any kind of improvements whatsoever in terms of transparency or take or whatever the issue is. I think there's there's been a lot of status quo in racing that doesn't realize it's on a sinking ship and needs to cons and it needs to you know please and satisfy its current customers rather than trying to pick up the dude in a bow tie who comes to the Belmont once you know once a year but yeah i just I, I think racing has has a problem about people leaving rather than bigger problem than getting new people i think that's a bigger issue i didn't actually didn't know that this happened until the weekend but uh apparently Shug McGahey was suspended in ohio in the past six months or so, and so he was running horses in his assistant, Robert Medina's name. And I know Bill's got a soapbox to get onto about this, but I, I think the general point is that Shug is seen as one of the cleaner guys in racing. And there are tons of guys, it seems, that are very obviously cheating that don't get popped like this. Bill, your thoughts? Well, Joe, you pretty much said it there. Uh, you know, we can't name names and be irresponsible to do so. But look, it's not just horse racing. In any endeavor in life when a lot of money is involved, be it sports, be it outside sports, people will do whatever they can to take an edge. There's people cheating. We know we know that there are people cheating. And probably, you know, a good number of people that are, are, are cheating. They never get caught, ever. You know, when's the last time you saw a, a positive on somebody with really any meat to it rather than, you know, a banamine overage or something like that? So, you know, I just – look, the Ohio Racing Commission did what they had to do. I mean somehow Shug McGahee will – obviously deserves the benefit of the doubt and obviously wasn't trying to cheat to win a race at Belterra Park. I couldn't even believe he was running a horse yeah, at Belterra Park. It must have been Park. his Kentucky division with a horse that, you know, went, went over to Ohio or something like that. But anyways, um, you know, obviously he's not cheating. And it just like, it just, I don't know why it annoyed me a little bit because again, you know, the Ohio Racing Commission did their job. But, you know, you see these guys, you know, day after day after day, claim a horse for 25, we're running 60 buyers, and it comes back and runs an 83 next time out, and they're 34% winning trainers. Why can they never catch them? Yeah. And they never, ever, ever do. So 
what it what it made me think a little bit more is about the Horse Racing Integrity Act, and I've never been a big fan of that. But this whole example kind of made me think maybe it's not the worst idea, or maybe it is time for this because. You know, we're not doing a good job catching people. We're just not. You know, it's kind of a joke then when Shug McGee is held up as the, you know, the villain. Oh, not – he wasn't held up as a villain. That's not fair because nobody made him out to be that and the Ohio Racing Commission certainly didn't either. But when you nail Shug McGee and you can't get anybody else, something's wrong here. And I'm just thinking that, you know, can you sort of do worse than we're doing now? Yeah, and it's funny like you say that we can't mention any names because we'll get sued. But everybody knows who these exactly, guys are, yes. and it's like I don't know. It reminds me of like if your if your spouse is like out late every night and isn't returning your texts and comes back smelling like somebody else, but you don't have any concrete proof that they're cheating. It's just all the signs are there that they're cheating. That's kind of what it reminds me of. That we don't have concrete proof of some of these guys cheating. But everybody knows it's happening, like you said, Bill, when, especially when they claim a horse and move the horse up 30 points on the buyer scale with on a regular basis. Like that's not I'm sorry, that's not done with just good horsemanship. So, yeah, it's it's I don't know what the what the solution is, but it's it's ridiculous that it's just accepted as part of the game that, oh, yeah, there's cheaters here. There's cheaters here. They're at the top of this trainer standings or they're winning trainer titles at this track. And no one seems to really care. I don't think people don't care. I just think they have no means to catch them. So I have a, I have a segue for that. Bill alerted me to this. This was in the TDN yesterday. Um, the Office of California Assembly Member Ash Kalra, who is a Democrat from San Jose, he announced the introduction of AB twenty one seventy seven, which is the Equine Welfare and Safety in Horse Racing Act. Um, so obviously a, a minor house of, of California government, but it did have some interesting ideas. It says the act mandates the use of CT scan screenings for horses, an on-site central pharmacy at tracks, and the prohibition of veterinarians from bringing medications on a track grounds, the prohibition of veterinarians from prescribing any medications other than for already diagnosed conditions, the suspension of a trainer's license pending investigation should one of their trainees die. I don't know about all that. That's a little ridiculous. But um, it authorizes the California Horse Racing Board to su- suspend or revoke a trainer's re- license for repeat medication violations. I don't have a problem with that. Uh, the interesting, most interesting one, I think, is the on-site pharmacy because that's a, that's a situation where I, I think – we have that ambiguity in terms of testing because there are so many different substances that are being brought in from all sorts of different places. So that idea, I think, cre- creating more uniformity, which I think is part of what the Horse Racing Integrity Act tries to do, that interests me a little bit. Yeah, this was interesting. I have no idea if this bill is going anywhere or not. Uh, there's some apparently something else out there called the Dodd Gray Bill, which they introduced beforehand. But this this one by uh, introduced by this guy has a lot more teeth in it and a lot more innovations and also – uh, you know, again, don't send hate mail, but was um, was uh, supported by PETA as well as some other animal rights group. And, you know, so far as, as passage, that's probably something that's going to help it. I love the idea about the on-track pharmacy. And again, it goes back to Hong Kong. You know, they do it there. And they're basically saying you veterinarians cannot bring any drugs on the backstretch from outside. And you're going to get all your uh, medications and drugs from the on-track pharmacy. I, I think it's a great idea. Yeah, and it, it, it kind of eliminates... I think what happens now, which is that the trainers are the cheaters are always ahead of the test. They always have the right substances, and then by the time the regulators catch up, they're on to something new. So I think that could help with that is have it more regulated and have it more uniform in terms of what you can use, and it's all on track. So I think that's interesting for sure. Well, one thing that has to go, and you mentioned that this thing about when a horse breaks down and suffers a fatality, the trainers, that can't be. Um, First of all, it's not fair. It's not right. You know, you can't suspend somebody when, by and large, they probably didn't do anything wrong. It was just bad luck. And secondly, already California is having such a problem with losing trainers to other jurisdictions. I mean, I don't know what trainer was going to stick around with that, you know, uh, hanging over their heads. Uh, I mean, that, so this bill needs work. Again, I don't have the faintest idea if this has a 1% chance chance or a 99% chance of passing. What was that site you had? Uh, but that was just for federal okay, stuff, okay, though. Okay, uh, right, right. Goodgov.gov. Dot, There's gov no dot something local or assembly yeah. version of it. Um, okay. But um, I think that we had some interesting things in there, and uh, people need to take a, a look at that. But again, the the, uh, the trainer getting suspended for horse breaking down, can't do that. No, that's stupid. So that's going to do it for this week's episode of The Writer's Room. I want to thank all you for listening. Thank Bill Finley, Alan Carrasso, our Green Group guest of the week, Jim Rome. Also, thanks to our new sponsor, Keeneland. We will see you next week. <laughs> <laughs>